Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Teva. Uh, we're here to talk today about computational creativity. But because everyone here is already a, a very sophisticated computer user and already has the latest model of this mind crystal to connect their brain to the cloud, I'm not going to talk that much about the computation side. I'm going to talk about the creativity side. So we're going to do this mainly in the context of generative art. And I'm going to show you now a small subset of the literally thousands of artworks that I've made over the last few years. So we'll start with this one. This is an alien landscape. I created all of the geometries here using Clojure, and then exported them to a package called Cinema 4D for rendering. And this was inspired very much by the covers of science fiction novels that I used to read as a boy in the 70s and early 80s. Now, what I would, you can help me here with this presentation. As I show each piece, if you like it, after I explain it, just clap a bit. And I want to try to take a survey to see which pieces are the most popular. Because in a, as an artist, you never know how other people are reacting to your work. So what do we think of this one? Yeah, it's OK. All right. From the same year, we have this one, also science fiction inspired, where I use Closure Script and 3JS to render a kind of photorealistic orb floating in the forest, and then wrote some code to do neural style transfer to turn it into something like a watercolor. What do we think of this? I agree, I like it better too. Uh, <laughs> this is taking some equations from physics, uh, vector fields, and applying false color to them to make a kind of decorative arts project. Uh, what do we think about this? Ah, uh, yep. I knew a sophisticated audience like this would enjoy more abstract pieces. So this, this is taking something from data visualization. This is called a tree map. And what I'm tree mapping here are this, uh, the successive digits of pi. Uh, this is a thing that I really like because the structure of the series of numbers kind of comes out in this really fetching way. How do we feel about it? Now here we have yet another set of equations from physics and cast theory. This is a Lorenz attractor, but I've rendered it by a large number of small golden beads flying through the air. And what was interesting about making this is that I wanted to render it in Blender, and the scripting language for Blender is Python, but I, I don't enjoy programming Python as much as I enjoy programming Clojure. So I ended up writing a program, or a library actually, that would compile my sketches in Clojure into the Python dialect used by Blender and export them so that I could live code Blender from Emacs using Clojure. How do we feel about this? Now, not everything that I made was on a screen. Sometimes it's physical stuff, right? Because you can use computers to do that, too. So I made this little flower pot, and I used genetic algorithms to breed a bunch of little uh, shapes. And I picked out my favorite one as a home for my little cactus friend here. How do we like that? OK, so you guys aren't as into plants. It's plain. Plants aren't your thing. Another similar project was one where I created a little hippopotamus out of wood. I started with some cartoony geometry, wrote some geometric algorithms in Clojure to turn it into a low poly hippo, and then used a CNC machine to mill it and finished it with files and sandpaper. Now, you might wonder, why did I make a hippo? And the answer is that my partner loves hippos, and I love her. So this was a Christmas present. How do we feel about that? Some of the things are animated. So this is, uh, I don't know if any of you read Dune when you were younger, but this is the machine uh, that powers the no ship, at least in my imagination. Uh, this is another one where the code was written in Clojure and exported to Blender through the, the Python cross-compiler. How do we feel? Mm, OK, all right. And then there were a whole series this spring of things like this, with these tile systems. And the thing about this is to find systems that can create aperiodic tilings and then animate the individual cells in ways that are interesting. Now, tell me what you think, and I'll tell you what I think of this one. Yeah, this is probably my favorite, too. I really like these. So if we're going to talk about creativity, we need to know what is creativity. And so that's like a super easy question. I mean, <laughs> the Wikipedia page is 20,000 words. There are 10 academic journals on the topic. And philosophers have been arguing about it for thousands of years. So I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of it here in this talk. Uh, let's, let's ask the modern people, who are all horrible management consultants, what they think. Well, they think that creativity is the production of novel and useful ideas. I agree, sort of. I mean, it's not wrong, but at the same time, useful is pretty vague, and gosh, there has to be more to it than that, doesn't there? 
Well, like, I mean, how does it really work? What, it, what happens to you when you're doing it? Well, let's ask the ancients. Because this is a closure talk, we have to do some things with word origins. Rich Hickey has taught us that. We must talk about where words come from. So the Greeks and the Latins use the words poesis and creare, a verb for this, which we get poetry and create from, but we're only their simple words for making things, like you could creare your dinner. So it's, it's not as high-minded for them as it is for us. And they thought that the way you would go about this is using techne or artis, which from which we get technology and art, which just meant kind of know-how or skill. And they had a really interesting perspective on the arts in particular because they believed that painters and sculptors and such were not actually doing anything original. They were just imitating the world that they see around them. And really, they only gave full credit to poets, but they thought that the poets could only be original because the gods moved them. So they would either send a muse down with a message and it would whisper in the poet's ear, or the poet would hear from their personal daimon or genius, depending whether you're speaking Greek or Latin, which is the kind of spirit you're born with that helps you do stuff. And in any case, when Plato Socrates talks about the muses, it sort of represents a kind of madness, a divine madness, like you're possessed by a demon. Now, this position goes on for a couple of thousand years, where the only change is it goes from a polytheistic Greco-Roman situation to the Christian God being the source of all creativity, and then we get to the Enlightenment. These guys, they have to be able to tell us something, right? Huh, it's a mystery. It can't be learned or taught. Thanks, big guy. So we move on to Schopenhauer. He tells you, well, you know, you have to have that skill, that techne, that artist, but you also have to be able to lose yourself in the experience of what is beautiful and sublime, which is really nice, but we're still back to the idea that you just fall into madness in some way and your skill carries you the rest of the way. And then we get to Nietzsche. Now here, I actually find this is closer to the truth, where he says that you, you have to have this cooperation between your Dionysian spirits and, your, and this Apollonian spirit, one of which is sort of crazy and passionate and the other of which is sober and restrained. But being Nietzsche, all of his philosophy is written in this really wordy kind of romantic poetry, and it would be great if there were some writer famous for concision who could boil this down to like, I don't know, four words or something. Oh yeah, Hemingway. So write drunk and edit sober is basically what Nietzsche is telling you, right? And, <laughs> but that, and that's a little bit helpful, but then like, if we look at it from psychology, what, what do we get? Well, we get to William James, beginning of the 20th century, and he says that creativity involves this process of blind variation and selective retention. Now, he doesn't mean blind like you cover your eyes and don't look. What he means is you're not paying attention to whether what you're making is valuable or not. You're just producing things and, and exploring the possibility space, and then another part of you kind of goes through and selectively retains the parts that you decide are good. So this dual process model emerges, where there's a sort of generator and filter, and the generator side is like the writer or the maker, and the filter side's like an editor or a critic, and one is essentially creative and the other essentially discriminative. And they go in a circle, so the better your taste gets, the harder it is to make something that passes that threshold, and then you have to get better at making stuff, and then that makes actually your taste better, and it goes around and around. People who are into AI right now will recognize this is the same architecture as a generative adversarial network. I don't think that's an accident. I think that we're actually hitting on something that is related to how we work, although only as an analogy. And people who like to read about cognitive neuroscience will recognize immediately that this dual process is pretty similar to what you found in Thinking Fast and Slow. I don't have time to describe the book. Please read it if you haven't, it's great. Uh, and the same dual process shows up in the idea of the conscious and the unconscious, right? So this is old psychological and philosophical stuff that turns out to kind of map onto some stuff from evolution. Like we have these, these new capacities as humans that allow us to be really verbal and reasoning and logical, and then we have this stuff that's probably shared with all the other animals that allows us to do things really quickly. And that's because our brains can work in a sort of parallel way, doing associative, intuitive, and spatial things. And if you want to think about this kind of more concretely, imagine trying to solve the equations to catch a ball that someone has thrown to you. It will have bounced off of your nose by the time you get anywhere, but your brain underneath can just reach out and grab it out of the air because it has these capabilities. And in this case, if I want to make a super nerd analogy, I would say something like the conscious mind is like your single-threaded CPU, and your unconscious mind is like this massive GPU processor that's underneath doing all the hard work. The bad news is you can only see what the conscious is doing, and it's this tiny part of this very poorly drawn iceberg that I made for this talk. And the unconscious is this enormous part underneath that is super powerful and gets all the good work done. But what I'm gonna talk about today is how we can sort of harness both of them and make them work together. And I'm gonna do that through three case studies, each using a different mixture of these parts of the mind. 
Now the first one is this logo, which I made for a company that I founded with a couple of colleagues in Berlin earlier this year. This is our consultancy. This is not actually meant to be a gross pitch, but here we are. And uh, <laughs> when I started making this logo, I drew a zillion of these different, different combinations. I didn't like any of them. And I reached out to some very well thought of uh, designer friends, and they gave me some options. They were great, but they weren't the right thing. And the problem here is that my generator wasn't able to keep up with my filter. What I wanted was so specific that I couldn't quite generate something that would match. But the good news is that computers are amazing at blind variation. You can get them to produce a tremendous number of possibilities very easily. And so I did what I often do when I have a difficult problem. I wrote a computer program. And that computer program I called the Logomatic. And here is a page of output from it with these lovely little squiggly snail things. And these are all things that could become logos if you chose to. And with a few tweaks of the parameters of the app, I was also able to generate these. You can kind of see the closure logo emerging naturally from the system in there. Or you can look at this, and you can see all these, uh, these sort of triangular forms, the bottom right one of which would be a great design for an outdoors company for mountaineering. And the, uh, the interface for doing this all runs in the browser with this tiny little control panel, and everything updates in real time as you change the parameters. And you can very quickly use this kind of one-off tool to explore a possibility space. Now, in this particular case, it's only one page of closure script. So if you want to have a look at how you might go about doing it, you can take a look at the code, which is at my GitHub, or you can take a look at the live running system, which is also up. And that's also linked from the GitHub. So if you go there and look for Logomatic, you will find it. Now, here's. Another thing that I did in the spring, which was a series of Truchet tilings. Now, this case study is about a situation where the generator and the filter are both working really well. They're kind of both working at the same time. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, Truchet tilings are a kind of setup where you take a small number of components that can be set next to each other in a grid that can make a very large number of possible drawings. One that some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with is this one. And in fact, I know at least one person in this audience was deeply affected by the VIC-20 in his youth, and this slide goes out to you, sir. Uh, I, too, spent a lot of time with 8-bit micros, and this kind of thing is the first programming that I ever did as well. So I looked at this old one, this, and I created something called 10 Go to 10, which is an animated version that's a bit slicker, built with closure this year. How do we feel about this? We like this? Great. And then I got interested maybe in the circular version. This is the same kind of system, but it's using little curves. And I thought, well, you know, it's really kind of cool looking, but wouldn't it be cooler if it was moving? I mean, yeah. So I made this one. And, and I thought, well, you know, if it was more solid with better colors, and maybe it would look like some cells dividing and merging and that kind of thing. And, and at this, this whole time, it's not that I'm not able to think of ideas about it or anything like that. It's I'm having ideas, and I'm using the abilities that we have from our conscious to sort of reason about it and program a computer to let me try different things. And I'm thinking, OK, what about opacity and this kind of thing, which is almost like a circuit board? And this led quite naturally to this one. How do we feel about this one? Of the moving ones, this is my favorite. It's using a kind of recursive system of equations to build sort of subversions that still tile perfectly, and then it's animated, and it was super fun, but it's still less than 100 lines of closure, ultimately. And then when I was looking at this, I thought, you know, it would be great if this were extruded in 3D. So I wrote a ray tracer in C, and I sent these things over there, and I made this homage to Jorge Luis Borges. And for this one, what I want is a round of applause for Jorge Luis Borges. Can we hear that? Yeah. All right. And then the last case study is one where I was working with some colleagues at a studio in Berlin called Studio Non. These are very, very talented digital designers. And uh, they got a contract with the Futorium, this amazing looking building, which is a new museum that has just been completed. It opened a few weeks ago in Berlin. And it's a museum in reverse. Instead of being a museum of the past, it's a museum of the future. And the thing that we agreed with them to make is a kind of display about the possibility of jobs being automated in which people can talk to an actual robot about what's going to happen to their jobs in the future. And the display looks like this. And uh, there's a robot arm inside of a glass box. And the outside of the glass box is a touch screen. And we actually draw the interface elements with a marker that's being held by the robot arm. And uh, the big problem here was how do you make some really aesthetically pleasing handwriting for a robot arm trapped inside of a glass box? So, <laughs> so what I went to was the past. And many, many of you of a certain age will recognize this as a screen or set of screens from War Games, a movie from the 80s. And all of these screens are generated by a now quite antique HP vector display. And I was lucky enough, searching around, to find an enthusiast who had a copy of the ROM that ran the display. 
So uh, there I was, I had Emacs and I had Clojure and I live coded my way into the ROM and extracted the original code that was running this thing and then pulled out the instructions for each character, translated them into the programming language for the robot, and next thing you know, you've got this. And the robot would like to know, do you like your work? Do you enjoy it? <laughs> uh, how do we feel about this, this robot arm thing? So one thing about this I'll say that makes me really happy is, as far as I know, it's the uh, first piece of work on permanent display in a major European cultural institution that was made with closure. So that's kind of fun. So having gone through all that, I want to talk about perspective, and specifically the kind of perspective we have culturally on the idea of creativity, what, what it entails, how it works, and, and what you can do with it. So this object on your screen here is called a Penrose Triangle. And it's one of what are called the impossible solids, because if you look at it carefully, there is no way that it can be both in front of and behind itself at the same time, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. Except that if you look at it the right way, it absolutely can be. So this is a three-dimensional rendering of a Penrose Triangle, and the shadow gives away what's really happening here. Or if we want to put a finer point on it, here is a video that kind of shows you the behind the scenes of how you can make something that shouldn't be able to exist. Now, this kind of thinking is really important for things like if you're debugging a program, it means that something has happened that you thought was impossible, and the ability to contemplate the impossible and see what perspective will let you see it is incredibly important in our trade. So starting from there, I would like you to consider this perspective, which is very widely held in our culture, this idea that art and design are very similar to each other because they're visual and kind of whimsical, and science and engineering are very hard and mathematical and practical, and never the twain shall meet. But in my opinion, this is wrong. This is completely wrong. And to, to sort of help you give a sense of where I'm coming from on this, I'm gonna give you a quote from uh, someone else who you may have heard of, who says that there's really no logical way to discover elemental laws. There's only intuition. And from that, I want you to consider the possibility of this perspective of these things, that art and science are actually way more like each other than, than either are like design or engineering and vice versa. Now, I, I don't actually believe this. What I really believe is one step further, and that's that these categories are all rubbish, and that the real truth is that intuition and reason are basic facilities that we all have and can use for everything, and art and science and design and engineering are all just points on a continuum. So what I want to do in this talk, the most important thing to me, is to encourage people to explore whatever side of that continuum they have left unexplored in the past. So for artists and designers, what I might say is, Revisit mathematics. You were probably taught bad classes at school by teachers who you deserved better than, and for that reason you might have turned away from it, but that stuff is great. There's all sorts of things in there that you can use to improve your art practice. And think about exploring formal methods, right? You, things that what we call computer programs are exactly what Saul LeWitt was making when he would deliver artworks to museums as a set of instructions rather than as a finished artifact. And if you believe that this is a good thing for you to do, then I recommend that you start with creative coding. Because if you spend six months, even six months, just playing around with introductory tutorials to processing, at the end of that, you are going to have better geometry and algebra than you ever thought you could. Now, there aren't very many artist designer types who don't know how to code in this room, so I'm gonna talk more to you engineering types, people who may have had a STEM education and, and have a very specific way of looking at the world. So I'm encouraging you to push yourself more towards your intuition, for which we have to talk a little bit about the phenomenology of it, that is what it feels like. So everyone here has probably had a, a eureka moment at some stage, and it's also where we get our word heuristic, right? And this feels like a flash of insight. The original version, of course, is Archimedes having this sort of flash while he's in the bathtub. Here, I assume, in Finland, everybody gets this flash while they're in the sauna. But the idea is that you're very relaxed and your, your subconscious, your intuition, can send a message, like tie it to a balloon and send it up to the conscious so that you can know a new thing. And when you have a creative flow state, as, as artists typically do, what it feels like is as if you have sustained access to that same source of inspiration. And this is a very powerful thing. And I'm sure some of you have also had the feeling when you're coding that you're almost like receiving the thing through an antenna that allows you to do things that you maybe otherwise couldn't do. So it can't be forced, right? You have to relax into this, you have to, have to cultivate a certain openness to be able to do this kind of thing. And so I will give you some takeaways, some steps that you might take to improve your ability to channel this side of yourself. Uh, first, consider taking an art course. This really works. Like if you go to learn how to draw or to sing, uh, you, will, you will be forced to use your intuition because you can't brute force your way through these things with pure reason. Something else you could take is maybe some psychedelic mushrooms. Um, many people have told me that this was their way of opening their mind, and who am I to say that they're wrong? It may even be possible that 
I have accidentally consumed some mushrooms of this type at some stage in my own life. Another thing that I can recommend is to begin a daily practice of meditation. A huge number of people have told me that this has changed their life. And if you find that you're the, you, you've received the kind of education that has led you to believe that everything in life can be decided by A-B tests and updating Bayesian priors, then I recommend you immediately quit your job, take a year off, and do all three of these things concurrently for the whole time, and then come back and tell me how it went. And the reason that I want to encourage everyone to do this is that the only way really that you can bring yourself together and use all the parts of yourself to be the best and most complete version of you that you can be is to exploit all of these facilities at once. And I think being that version of yourself is one of the best things you can do with this, your one and only life. And with that I say, thank you. <laughs>